Hey everybody, my name is Kristen, AKA Like Water, and welcome to today's In Session AI and Music, Non-Human and Indigenous Listening with Kite. Kite, AKA Susan Kite, is an Oglala Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer raised in Southern California. Her research is concerned with contemporary Lakota ontologies through research creation, computational media, and performance practice. Recently, Kite has been developing a body interface for movement performances, carbon fiber sculptures, immersive video, and sound installations. Kite investigates our current and future relationships to non-humans, especially to technology and artificial intelligence, as well as developing protocols through her artistic practice. This person is incredible. If y'all don't already know, it's men incredible stuff. Non-Humans, AI, and Indigenous Listening is a lecture first given at the Zoetic Symposium at MIT Media Lab in April 2018, first outlining Kite's research on Lakota ontologies and human interaction with technology and the necessity of ethical ontological relationships with artificial intelligence. We are honored to have her here with us today and share this incredible information. If you haven't already known about her or checked her out, you definitely will want to now. Join me in welcoming Kai. Hello, hello. Hi. We're Thank so you. glad to have you here with us. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> This is going to be some incredible stuff. So I am going to get out of the way and allow you to share your incredible information. And um, I'm just excited for what you have to share. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kite or Suzanne Kite. Uh, these are my websites if you want to check them out. I'll start with uh, my formal introduction. How Mataki LP, Peti Wash Day, Suzanne Kite, Machia Pikushto. Oglala Hamacha, Chante Washtianepe Chiuzapo. My relatives, I shake your hands with a happy heart. Um, I'm currently based in Muskogee Creek Reservation, also known as Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'm very excited to share, share my work today. So I started off as a violinist. I was a I was very, very into violin. I played classical violin and klezmer violin actually until I was about um, in, in undergrad. When I was about uh, 19, 20, I decided I wanted to be a composer. I was tired of playing uh, like the music of dead white men. I wanted to play music by people um, who were more like me. And um, I started to pursue making instruments. This was at a time when um, uh, actually, it was even uh, different people were experimenting with but different controllers and button situations for Ableton and for other uh, composition and performance programs. And it became possible to make your own uh, interfaces and interface culture and interface customization was starting to really pick up. So I started to get really into uh, the question of how I could interact with the computer in a way that I felt reflected uh, my goals as an artist. And my goal was to disappear into, compos into the composition. I wanted to perform um, in a way, just like when I play violin, I could feel the, the dissolving of my, of my presence, the dissolving of my brain and just the presence of my body. I wanted that with the computer. And this dissociative feeling drove me to work with uh, sonification, which is where you take data and you turn it into sound and then visualization. And then finally what I call tactilization. So that's uh, taking uh, data or visualization sonification and turning it into the body movements. So in this process, I started to work on these carbon fiber body sculptures that went on my arms or my chest or my head and I started to work with microcontrollers and what are called force sensitive resistors. Uh, this was almost a decade ago now and figure out ways where I could control sound and video with my body. Uh, this was the first open source uh, tech we used. I worked with a friend James Hurwitz who helped uh, 
use things like this open source software interfacing to make these things possible. This was a long time ago now. And I'll play you um, the first piece I ever made with uh, my body interface, which we called the Oglala interface. <laughs> I still really like that artwork. It's called People You Must Look At Me. And it's a way it's, you know, there's carbon fiber sculptures like, like you see here. These ones are much larger. But it started me on this path of understanding that I could make um, work from an Oglala Lakota perspective, from an indigenous American Indian perspective, and that I wanted to interact with music and the computer and with improvisers um, in a way that stayed true to my, um, you know, my, my religion, my, um, my people and our beliefs. And I wanted to explore that. Um, and so that piece was about a death, uh, the death of my mother. Um, and in that process, I, I learned a lot about myself and, and how to move forward and on a path towards like communicating, um, like an indigenous experience. Uh, and so, from there, I started to explore more sculptural stuff. Um, this is more recent work. Uh, another example of taking, um, you know, ways of listening. So, so this one is a. I consider these scores. They're sculptures of uh, Makaonia, um, which is the place that uh, the Lakota emerged from the earth in the Black Hills. And um, this piece was realized by Avind Kang, who's a a violist, Comanche, all around, like a string player um, who teaches at CalArts. And uh, so we worked on this together. So there's a, there's a realization of the sculpture as if it's a score. It is a score since I say it's a score. Same with these. So these are um, Lakota style geometries, which I'm really, really obsessed with and probably will be the next five years at least of my life is working with these symbols. And um, so this is a score on hide and it's embroidered uh, with machine embroidery, which is another practice I work on. So I will talk a little bit about this idea of non-human futures. So when I speak about relationships to non-humans, especially to technology and artificial intelligence, I understand that humans are already surrounded by objects which are aren't considered intelligent or even alive. They're seen as unworthy of relations. So my question is how can humanity create a future between uh, us and our technologies or artificial intelligences without, let's say an ethical and understanding of ways of being which uh, define who's our relation and who is not. Instead of just letting um, you know, governments and law and uh, state power and cap capitalist structures tell us who is a being and who is not. So in order to create relations with any non-human entity, including artificial intelligence, um, we have to understand that these relationships are, aren't with beings that just seem human. Uh, 
the first step is to acknowledge and understand and know that non-humans are being in the first place. And that's where we can turn to indigenous ontologies um, on, on all continents and understand that they already contain ways of understanding who is a being and who is not in those specific contexts, those places. Uh, so my general arguments about this are that indigenous ontologies are essential tools for creating relationships with non-humans and it's necessary to employ indigenous concepts um, in context, so in their historical context, in their locational context. Um, and so I really like this quote from Vine Deloria Jr., um, who's a Dakota philosopher. He says, uh, respect involves two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans and their communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. The other attitude is to seek to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutually agreeable basis. So when we talk about machines be possibly being entities or artificial intelligence, um, you know, being part of our lives in the future, because right now AI doesn't, it does not, it, it doesn't exist as it's not, there's no general intelligence. There's no, uh, there's no artificial intelligence. It, it just, it's a, it's a marketing tool in a lot of ways. Uh, there is deep learning, there is machine learning, there is um, experiments with uh, machine cognition, but it's not what, what we project onto it. Uh, but I see that as a great opportunity as an access point to a lot of people um, who have never considered the interiority um, or, the, or the possible uh, beinghood of things outside of humans um, and outside of certain types of animals. So what Vine Deloria prompts me to think about is that um, it takes self-discipline as human communities to say, I will respect other beings. And it takes covenants with those groups of other beings uh, in order to say that we can um, work together in the future. And so the Lakota people have covenants with bison, for example, famously. We have covenants with um, spirits. We have covenants with um, many beings um, in our bioregional context that say uh, we, um, we respect you and we have a, we have a deal with you. Um, on a nation to nation basis. And so I think that's um, how I like to frame thinking about the possibilities for artificial intelligence if we see that in the future. So uh, another way to think about this is ideas about object mastery. Um, so Dylan Rainforth has this great quote I love that says, object mastery and territorial possession are de demonstrably part and parcel of the processes of genocide. So when we think about AI, um, a lot of people uh, think about uh, mastery and force um, in terms of the uh, science fiction depictions of artificial intelligence. And it's seen as uh, like a, fan a future fantasy. But the fact is that the mining and um, imperialist capitalist destruction of the earth is already enacting Mas object mastery and territorial possession. It says that rivers are not beings. It says that stones are not beings and that the humans living near those places aren't human enough, usually they're brown people, to deserve protecting their environment for their future generations. Um, and so when we talk about land or location, while it seems very uh, broad to say talk about land um, and but when you talk about it from an indigenous perspective you we don't want our land reduced to an, an inanimate object it's alive it keeps us alive uh, so land or location if it does get reduced to this idea of inanimate object uh, if we see it as incapable of intelligence or agency it just becomes a resource to use and discard so when the, ma the logic of mastery and possession is exploded over entire continents, as we've seen um, in uh, many continents on this earth, uh, every entity gets possessed along, it, along with it. No entity can escape this um, territorial possession. So I'm just going to, this is a, 
it's a lot of words, but this is um, an example of how Lakota people uh, understand what is relation and what is not, um, who can we, who can we can enter relationships and who cannot. So does this entity have life, breath, spirit? Does it have the ability to grow, to communicate? Does it have memory? Does it have a spirit associated with its movement? And furthermore, um, does it have uh, an, an interiority to it? So this is from um, a book by David C. Posthumus um, on Lakota ontology, Lakota beinghood. And this talks about um, the possibility for life and ghost and guardian spirit um, as unknowable possibility. So if I can't know if another being such as the stones melted into artificial intelligence computers are beings in themselves, if I can't know for sure, then how can I, um, how can I disrespect that um, without knowing? And I think uh, this is how I apply uh, concepts of beinghood to 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 artworks and to sculptures. So this is a sculpture that is a collaboration between myself and the artist Devin Ronneberg, and it's called Telling Rock. And this uh, we consider to be made of song, power, sound, processors, machine learning, decisions, handmade circuitry, gold, silver, copper, aluminum, silicon, and fiberglass. And um, we're looking at it from below this angle, so it's mounted on the ceiling. And interactions with the hair braids uh, can um, have an effect on the lights and the voice that is that are speaking from this uh, object. And this object was a way for us to ask the question: uh, How can I? Is it possible even to build uh, a composition system? Uh, a compute computational entity and interact with it in an, an ethical way? And of course the answer was no, it's not possible right now. Uh, and, but it is possible to explore frameworks within our communities that already are ethical. So we started with um, a vision from my grandfather, Mahpia Najim, who told me a story about crying for a vision and he looked over a hill and saw a man, a woman, and a horse with long flowing hair and like an infinity of constellations in the strands. And he suggested I make art about that. So that this was the result. And I'll play, this is not a great video, but it's a video. And this object was us trying to make sense of if it was possible to use computational materials in, in an ethical way. Um, and what are, what are the ethics around using computational materials at all? Uh, while there's no way for us to know where the mind materials from our, all of our computational systems are coming from, we could begin by doing a simple acts of asking um, my cousin Corey Stover, um, who uh, is very knowledgeable about Lakota culture, advice about how to greet the metals melted into this computational object in a good way, in an ethical way. Corey suggested that we approach these metals as if they had a ghost, um, perhaps a ghost wrenched from the earth, and suggest asking its name, asking it for forgiveness by the, for the process by which it was removed from the ground. This possibility led to us attempting to think about how we could listen to objects um, in, an, in a Lakota way, in a more indigenous way. And uh, we asked Corey if we could learn the names of the stones inside the piece. And he suggests we sit quietly and listen, but without the ears. The songs like you see on the screen are written in a similar way, listening beyond trying to subvert our loud clamoring mind. So this is a process of listening without the ears, which is not dissimilar to other forms of composition where one listens inward and waits to hear. So my question has become, where do these inner songs come from? Are we hearing or composing or imagining or improvising? So um, there's Corey and me welcoming the piece. And this led to a lot of other research such as uh, this paper making came with the machines and a very, very long project called uh, Indigenous Protocols and Artificial Intelligence. 
And I'll just show you a couple um, sections of that. So this question of a good way. So good way is kind of a colloquial English term for talking about um, Lakota ethical protocols. Uh, when we think about a good way, we think try to think seven generations ahead. Not what's good, just good for us today, but what's good seven generations from now. And so we imagine any anything can built, be built in an ethical way. It's a choice to not. And I imagine that things can be built with a confluence of protocols and indigenous protocols. Um, some people know about, uh, you know, uh, uh, burning sage, um, that's a specific indigenous protocol, uh, burning tobacco, offering tobacco, but there are, each community has so many protocols. And while they have been denigrated as, uh, let's say like, um, not intellectual or having no reason, uh, these are these protocols have allowed us to have good relationships with the land and the stars for millennia. And so we want to, to figure out how to apply our, the, the protocols from our community onto the, um, the computational systems we use in our community as well before they have an effect on us in a negative way because it's always, uh, you know, black and brown communities that are hurt and oppressed by technological systems first. And in this way, I've tried to um, grow closer to possibilities and thinking through the expertise of people like my aunts who don't have university educations and I'm trying to, you know, trying to, I fully honor and uplift their um, level of expertise and getting closer to concepts about stones having the ability to communicate um, amongst many, many non-humans. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna skip forward to talk about, you can read this in the papers if you would like, and talk about my current, some of my current research with uh, the artist, Alicia B. Wormsley, uh, who has, uh, share with the world these, it originally was a, uh, an installation of just said there are black people in the future. Um, she's an artist based in Pittsburgh. And Alicia and I have spent a long time now working on black and indigenous dreaming workshops. So finding ways um, to come to rest, um, uh, but, but very importantly to dream and moving dreams and visioning is the way we move knowledge from the non-human world, the spirit world into the physical world. And this isn't like, this isn't woo woo, um, non-grounded stuff. This is uh, drawing from ancient practices that keep our communities safe and healthy. And uh, the, part of this process ha uh, has led to this project I have called There Lies the Road. And, um, you know, I want my work and my composition work, music, sculpture, anything to be an antithesis to um, things like this. This is Google's values, if, if you can call them that. And so, for example, they have ideas like fast is better than slow and um, focus on the user and all else will follow. Th these are the type of uh, values that are being blanketly uh, offered to the entire world when we want our own community's values to be reflected in what we're using. So in the process of, of working on this project, I have been asking one main question, and that is where do songs come from? So as songwriters and composers and musicians, we know that when we make things sometimes, they don't come from us, they come from somewhere else. When we become channels, um, this has been in the Lakota culture, this is sometimes considered the being a, a hollowed out bone, like a bone whistle where uh, spirit world can come through you. But uh, I was a, lucky enough to be able to do a lot of interviews with Lakota artists and uh, performance artists and singers and try to think about how um, in our culture, we have, a, we have 
clear protocols for approaching the non-human world and moving song into this reality. So I'll come back to these diagrams, but um, in this process, I, I've been working on a machine learning hair braid interface. This was the first piece I made with it called Listener. And uh, this was using the machine learning system Wekinator uh, developed by Rebecca Freebrink. And this uh, system, for you sound nerds out there, it, it works by, and I, I like this system because it's very simple and I'm not trying to um, algorithmically produce music. What I'm trying to do uh, is create that circular relationship with the computer where my decisions and its decisions become entangled. So in this piece listener uh, and in the scul that sculpture you saw with the hair braids, I am uh, moving the hair braid and it has a uh, set of accelerometers on it. And the accelerometers are changing a synthesizer, just a software synthesizer. And the synthesizer is outputting sound and the sound is being captured um, by a Wekinator, um, by, by a Ableton a Max for Live patch. And it's analyzing frequencies and, and sending out data to Wekinator. And Wekinator is then listening to those frequency changes. And based on those frequency changes, it's, it's rotating um, a dial in another program. And, uh, and originally I had it controlling uh, VJ and software. And then I'm watching the dial that's projected behind me in this photo, and making my decisions on how to move and what to say based on that dial. But I, it's become so spiraled together, the decision-making that I become very confused and I just, and I basically am dissociated on stage because I'm working so hard to stay focused on the decision making that I'm making and it's making. And so in this new version um, that I've developed, uh, this is a hair, 200 feet of hair braid uh, that results in, uh, I think there's three accelerometer uh, packages on this braid for audience members to experience and projection behind it. And um, trying in this piece to ask the question, like, how can I take this good way, Lakota ways of ethical decision making, and combine it with what I've learned from Indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence workshops, getting to speak with other Indigenous uh, artificial intelligence practitioners around the world, and combine it with my love of wearing, um, doing wearable body interfaces and performance, and really ask uh, these questions about how stones are involved in this process, how the stones melted into that computer interface um, are part of my, my world and um, how I can be better involved in them. Uh, so how are they ontol ontologically involved? So how are they being in the first place? What is their beinghood status? And, um, you know, spending a lot of time talking to my, uh, my colleagues, um, Jason Lewis, Scott Benison of Andan, um, my cousin here, uh, Clementine Bordeaux. And trying to synthesize all those ideas together um, into these designs. So these designs are a collaboration between myself and Bobby Joe Smith III. And uh, we, if you look at these designs, there's there was this symbol in the center, this four directions kind of star in the center. And I, I think about that as the artwork and the artwork is collaborating with simultaneously with, non, with the non-human world in the cosmos and with the land because we need both the unseen and the seen realms to, to make new things in this world. I imagine um, all of these kind of star points as protocols surrounding the new art object, the new song, whatever it is that you're making in this world, you, it goes through many steps, both seen and unseen. You maybe you feel a strike of inspiration. Maybe you sit down, you offer tobacco to um, the part of the forest that you're doing a field recording at. Um, maybe you uh, give back to the community in the process of collaborating with someone. Um, maybe you hear something and you don't even remember where it came from, but you're remembering from long ago. 
those things are kind of interactions uh, across time and space, uh, knowable and unknowable, that help create uh, a song, a new song in a good way. And in this process, I worked with Devin Ronneberg, Ronneberg uh, to develop uh, a touch designer patch uh, where we could generate these stones that look like a Lakota Fairburn agate. Um, and as we, and so as the people interact with this hair braid interface, they're interacting conceptually with all of the research and all the interviews that I did, but they're also um, interacting with the uh, improvisations from different musicians. So um, these musicians uh, offered their time in interpreting those designs um, that I showed in the last sl slide. They interpret the designs um, based on what we talked about, based on um, interviews, and then the person in the space. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, takes this hair braid and moves it around, and then that creates. Um, basically, they're interacting with a trained orb. So Wekinator ends up producing kind of an orb of interaction around the braid. Um, and so I imagine all these interactions as moving together, offering of tobacco and of food and to create this, this artwork. So I'll play you a little bit of the sound. <laughs> amazing musicians I got to work with in that process. I, I basically only work with improvisers. Um, I also had uh, the wonderful ability, like opportunity to work with and get to know the Lakota um, Native American church leader and uh, peyote singer Santi Witt. And I'll play, and, and his, um, my collaboration with him has been extremely rewarding because he is so able, he's so um, skilled at articulating the way when he, he composes music, he, the way it comes from uh, the spirit world through him. And that has been very inspiring to know that song is, I love songwriting so much. Um, not that I write songs very much, but as a composer, I, I love songwriting because it allows a really clear ethical process to happen. You don't need to um, extract anything necessarily to write a new song. You can just open yourself up. And I think that's a really good starting place for a lot of non-Indigenous people to begin to see that it's possible to not cause harm in this world and that um, uh, it's possible to re be reciprocal. So Santi always communicates how much he gives back to the community, how much he gives back to um, children in his life, and how much he uh, gives back to um, the spirit world and the, the natural world. So let's watch a tiny bit of this. <laughs> so this is a chrome kettle I had specially ordered. I like the, the chrome, the guy that made it, there's something, if it's the chrome in there, I think it might be steel, he can be, uh, cast the chrome with it. This has this beautiful sound, and water probably about that far in there, water spray about that far. And then on the bottom, when I tie it, 
that has the, the star formation to represent you know, the star, the star people, the Chakpi. And then there, these stones I got too, they're magnetic stones. Mm -hmm. They're tied up inside here. And I, I don't know what, they're, what it's called either, but they, they, they cling together. So when I, when I put the, the rocks together, they all are magnetic. Mm -hmm. And it's some kind of special stone, so it's not like no metal or anything, it's a stone. A magnetic, magnetic stone, I've never heard of a magnetic stone before. Really, so I like to use it, it's, it's perfect for my hide. I know there's this pile of really <clears throat> seven of them. So we have the seven and four. So we tie it down every four, seven rocks. And, and in the end result, yeah, it has the star in the bottom. So this is a morning star. Helmet, is that like, like a mirror of the spiritualist? But it's kind of a journey. I want to get on and understand it myself. Find out how I can use it in my, my spirituality, in my, my ceremonies and my prayers. So I extended it, the rock, to my, my prayers. And I'm praying with it, and I know that there's going to be a, a good purpose. I'll show you another one I got. So um, that's just a very short example from a longer film. Um, uh, talking to Santi about his song making practice, uh, uh, which um, you can see him singing and myself with Third Coast Percussion Ensemble. We collaborated on a composition. You can see that online. And um, that composition, let's say we'll use that as the example for this graphic. So the composition is the star in the center. It's the, it's the resulting artwork. Um, it's the song he wrote in, while listening to birds. And it's the song I wrote while collaborating with many, many people. And, um, and it's the dreams, uh, that composition's built out of dreams of the instrumentalists. Um, and so, this star is all of those collaborations, seen, unseen dreams, visions, um, uh, thoughts, memories, all poured into one object, art object at the end. Um, deep research, all those things. And so on one end, we have a representation of the earth and the other a representation of um, a star and the human and non-human, the seen and unseen, cosmos and land collaborating in order to create um, a, an art object that is hopefully as ethical as we can possibly get or good or um, good for the world. So it's uh, very difficult to stand by things and say, oh, I did, a good, I did this in a good way. Um, and so that's what my practice reaches for. How, how, can I be, how can I make art in a way that is good for seven generations from now? Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's this composition style with all these symbol. I make compositions with those symbols and try to move my dreams into compositions for people to watch and, and read like this. And yeah, I'll end with a quote, um, which uh, is from my grandfather. So the future is dangerous, but as my grandfather uh, says, uh, spirits and ancestors are just there on the other side trying to help. And it is our responsibility to listen. So thank you, Wopila, for having me. Wow. I mean, I knew I was already excited um, just from what we had, had talked about and learned about, but it like blew me away. I feel like I have tons of questions, but so much insight all at the same time. So thank you for for sharing that and being so um, open and honest about your practice and, and your culture and, and your religion, as you said, and just all of what um, what plays a part in, in how you show up in the world. So that was incredible. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have a few questions to ask. Um, and the first one is, is pretty general. Um, how can an artist incorporate more AI into their live performance and more ethically, I guess, as well? Yeah, so I am not a coder. I don't really enjoy coding, so I don't do it. Um, I work with technologists like um, James Hurwitz and Jenna Ronenberg and many, many other people. But um, I really found Weckonator uh, to be an 
a decently easy tool for someone um, starting out. Uh, I, I find it to be really interesting to use. I also like it because it's, it's based on a pretty small data set. So that means that I make the data set and I train it myself. And that is far simpler. And I guess in the AI realm of things, it's kind of not as fun as these mega data set um, AI tools that people are, you, I use and experiment with. So when you work with things like uh, deep fakes or style GAN, or, you know, we see a lot of AI art work outputs visually. We also see um, some new natural language processing tools like GPT-2 and 3, like um, uh, voice uh, copying tools. And those are all very interesting, but they rely on data sets that, in my opinion, are unsafe and unethically collected and don't respect um, intellectual property and are... Uh, are, of course, should be experimented with and critiqued, uh, but I don't see them as uh, I don't see them as very interesting in terms of, you know, getting a shortcut to making something complex. I think that mm -hmm. slowness is good, and uh, I think that uh, that's why I really like Weconator because you train it yourself and. Um, it's so then I can say for certainty that it's not a Lakota artificial intelligence, but it is a, definitely an all Lakota data set because I did all the I've input all the, the movements into the data set. So um, I, I, I really enjoy that one. I think um, I do think that I use a lot of natural language processing tools in some of my like noise sets. So when I do um, I, I like create language outputs from them and then I have the computer read them or I read them and they are interesting, uh, but um, it's really easy. They're, they're actually so easily racist um, because the internet, they're built on the internet and the internet is racist. So I find them dangerous tools to experiment with um, personally. Yeah, so you feel like the more control you have over what data gets input into these programs the more ethical you're able to, or they're able yeah, to Yeah, sometimes the goal isn't to be ethical. Sometimes I just want to be creative and and critique things. So I have another film with Devin Ronneberg called Fever Dream, where we deep fake um, other, we deep fake powerful people onto uh, other people who are regretting their uh, contributions to the atom bomb, things like that, where we're, we're really, uh, trying to critique and I think that all artists have the tools at their hand to try to contribute good things to the world and even critical good things so I think that uh, when we use these tools we should use them with with great thought it, it, yeah. you know that really I think we should really think about our tools I mean I know people, you know, even with instruments, like any instrument, it's really important when, when you have a real relationship over a lifetime with an instrument, like, you know, um, people, people who play a uh, banjo or, or a fiddle, um, you know, I respect the, the fiddlers who have come before me in the history of, of like klezmer music and the Holocaust and the genocide of, of that. And I think banjo players, I really love when banjo players respect the history of uh, transatlantic slave trade and the movement of the banjo. And like, that's how I feel about all of our artistic instruments. We should respect their historical context, who they affect, who they hurt, who they help. Like it's all, that's what art is. What's the point? <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, it, it even, even you talking about it just like brings me deeper into my body. Like thinking about all the things that we interact with as artists without really you know, thinking too far beyond like the immediate emotion or vibe or, you know, skill, all of those things, but it's so much more to be explored. So thank you. Thank you for shedding that light. <laughs> um, and it kind of brings me to the next question um, around how did you even go about building these connections and collaborations with people who build these technologies and even you building these technologies? Uh, yeah, I... I started off by 
wanting to use the laptop on stage and I wanted to use it, but I was a violinist. So I could, I couldn't think about giving up like interaction with the instrument on stage. Like I still wanted to be involved. I found that I couldn't, I can't personally access that like disassociative feel by like standing at the laptop. And I really wanted to like disappear into it. And so, I mean, if you look up most of my performances, they're usually me doing something that looks like dance, but I'm not a dancer and I'm very, I think not good at dancing. I don't, I'm not trying to be good at dancing. I'm trying to move the instrument in a way that makes me hear, hear more or, or listen deep. I'm just trying to get into it. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's just a tool uh, to think alongside with and to try to think deeper into it. So that's how I got into wearables, into controlling things with my body. And then um, also into later into the Weconator thing. And then eventually um, as I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to take from tech, my interest in technology and how to, how to move that alongside Lakota beliefs and not compromise either one like um and i think a lot of times we are discouraged from taking our cultural experiences and knowledge and even experiences of diaspora and disconnection and really melding them with critical questions about technology and making art and sometimes it's scary to make the jump um but i just i spent a lot of time with good family members in a lot of conversation. And I found that the more religious and like, um, the more, like Lakota style religious, like the more spiritual the, my family members were, the easier it was for them to understand what I was trying to do. Like mm -hmm. that I wanted to make relationships with artificial intelligence in the future. And, and it was really, they were like, of course, like the spirit and everything, <laughs> like naturally, but the people who were not as, spiritual or like not interested in that they were like i don't get it like why would you do that it's not traditional and um yeah it's like the, the like elders are so much more hip than their younger generations that uh, which was cool to me and so that i just began and eventually i just had to take the take the leap take the risk and drag a couple family members with me and um yeah, and I, I think that's how I started using AI. Um, and also, especially the very important artist, Letitia Sonami, who was the first hand glove um, creator of an inter a glove that interacted with sound. Um, she made the ladies glove um, with the assistance of Bob Bilecki back in the, I think it was in the 90s. And mm -hmm. it was the first Max MSP. Um, it was before it was called Max, Max MSP, I think it was. Uh, but it control and so she was the one who started using Weconator was like you got to try this got to try this cool new machine learning thing um yeah that's awesome that sounds um I'm sure that that uh in a different way but it's relatable to so many people and that like there are just some folks that that get it right away and then some folks that just like don't get it and you know you kind of got to continue to listen to to what it is you feel like you're being called to to do and create so um Super excited that you had some folks that were like already rocking with you and jumping on that bandwagon to, to go on that journey. <laughs> yeah, it was my, my grandfather and like my great aunts were always like, absolutely. Um, I loved it. Yeah, they were cool about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, so next question, um, how did you, well, we have that and where we see it going. I guess, where do you see the trajectory of your career um, incorporating AI or not, or, you know, where do you, where do you see this going? Yeah. I, so I have a kind of a weird career trajectory in that I have found that it was, I, I've could, I lived in LA for, you know, all my life. And then until I was like, oh, I can't really do what I want to do here. So I ended up um, moving to Montreal um, and doing, um, uh, going the academic route because I was able to support my making art um, through Canadian support systems because they fund in, uh, Indigenous First Nations art um, at a much higher level and they they value it more honestly so the that allowed me to like 
dig into quite ask deeper questions than I was able to ask um, when I just considered myself a mere violinist. I was like, oh, I can't do anything. I'm just a violinist. I can't make my own things. I can't compose my own music. It felt very trapped. And so you know, the more I pushed myself and said, you know what, I'm an artist. Like I can do whatever. When you're an artist, you can do whatever you want. Uh, depend it's good to say I want to do whatever I want that doesn't harm other people, but I I can make sculptures, I can compose with rocks, I can give myself permission to interview family members who I was scared to interview. Like I give myself permission. And so that's my uh, you know, pathway into the future is to just always give myself permission to try to do my art in a good way try to give back. And um, I think my, the way I see artificial intelligence, I, I'm grateful to be on a bunch of projects that are gonna be very long-term supported um, explorations of building new AI tools from indigenous perspectives, um, not just from my, my perspective, but from Hawaiian and Maori and um, uh, so many different indigenous perspectives and in, into the future. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for more interesting projects. And the, the big one is um, I have this project with Alicia Wormsley called Creative Time, and we'll be able to have, we're doing public art presentations of black and indigenous AI dreaming um, in 2022, 2023. Thank you so much, Kai. Like I said, this is this has been extremely eye-opening um, and extremely inspiring. Tons of homework that you have left me with <laughs> to, to sort through all of these incredible opportunities and, and what exists beyond kind of what artists are currently um, exploring. So this was incredible. Thank you so much for your time and for gifting this to us. Thank you so much for having me. It's fun. Awesome. So this has been In Session Kite. Incredible, incredible. My name is Like Water and it has been my absolute pleasure to guide you on this journey and I hope that you enjoy. See you next time.